Uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining again. I know these are uh, long days, uh, especially for those that uh, uh, were part of the early beginning this morning. Uh, and also thanks to those that are joining that were not part yet of the earlier sessions uh, today. Uh, my name is Stefan Verhulst. I'm the co-founder of uh, GovLab here at uh, New York University, but I'm also honored to be on the program committee of Data for Policy and also being one of the editors in chief of Data and Policy at uh, uh, Cambridge University Press. And it's especially my uh, honor and delight uh, to introduce one of our keynote speakers. Um, as you all know, during a time of COVID, uh, it's easy to get despaired. And uh, especially when you look at uh, some of the actions that are happening in this country where I'm based, it's very easy to get despaired. But then I realized that there are actually people like Alex Vespignani that makes the despair go away because uh, luckily we have people like Alex that are working hard to really provide for the science and especially the evidence on what is the current state of the epidemic, what works, what does not work, and how should we actually organize ourselves as a society to deal with a dynamic threat like um, uh, the epidemic that we are currently, uh, uh, unfortunately, experiencing. And so uh, Alessandro or Alex uh, Vespignani is the director of the Network Science Institute at uh, Northeastern University. He has about 15 other affiliations, which I won't uh, uh, mention, except for saying is that he is a pioneer, if not the uh, um, uh, almost the hero as it comes to digital epidemics or epidemiology. And uh, today, uh, Alessandro will uh, share with us some of the lessons learned with regard to applying network science to uh, epidemiology, but also uh, will reflect on some of the remaining challenges in order to, for instance, making computational social science and digital epidemiology more mainstream and also more established, uh, both in terms from a scientific point of view, but also in terms of being accepted by the policy community. But before um, um, Alex um, um, gives his, um, um, his presentation, I've also asked Alex to briefly introduce uh, uh, himself, because I said uh, there's a lot more to be known about what his current position is vis-a-vis -vis the epidemic. But also, uh, I think uh, it would be good, Alex, to also know uh, what your trajectory has been uh, with regard to uh, how you ultimately ended up in network science, uh, being a very recent, of course, discipline, uh, but also understanding um, anyway what the background is and even where Network Science Institute is located within the university, for instance. So with that, Alex, if you could uh, briefly introduce yourself and also the Network Science Institute and then um, go straight into your uh, presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very glad to, to be here and to have this, uh, this presentation. Now you, uh, Stefan, you, you, you're asking me to, to have, how to say, um, an overview of my trajectory, the Network Science Institute. That, that, I think, especially the Network Science Institute by itself, it should be something that takes uh, a talk by itself, uh, right. uh, in a way. But I will try to be brief. You know, by... Uh, Training. I'm, I'm a physicist, and I was a straight physicist for uh, about 10, uh, 10, 15 years. In a sense, I was working on randomization group, uh, uh, computational approaches to material science, uh, uh, statistical physics, uh, and by you know, if you're in physics, you use a lot networks you use a lot uh, you know lattices and how the materials are formed you use large scale simulation at a certain point when i read a couple of papers about complex networks that were more obviously uh, interesting in the context of uh, uh, computer science and social sciences because of their richness and complexity and they decided to just by by, by chance uh, with one of my collaborators to have a 
couple of studies of it. And then really we got fascinated. Some of the equations we were using and some of the dynamical processes we were stu studying in physics uh, were completely altered in those realities. They were changing uh, considerably. And my approach uh, to, to the field was through actually computer viruses, the spreading of computer viruses. From there, I transitioned slowly in a, in a uh, computer science department uh, where I got more and more into data science, uh, social networks, uh, the importance of gathering, you know, uh, novel digital data streams in order to, to, to model phenomena. Uh, and after 10 years in a computer science, working mostly on computer science topics, I, I, somebody, you know, that was in a, a epidemiology department told me, well, but you know, that the, the, can, the kind of approach, uh, approaches you are developing could be used in, uh, in biological uh, uh, computer viruses and so in, in, in biological viruses and then I transitioned into public health and now it's about 20 years that I work in computational epidemiology and that I will show you a little bit what, mm -hmm. what I mean by it and the importance of data. My talk will be a lot about data and what is the importance of data. Uh, the Network Science Institute is something that we are uh, created uh, about five years ago, six years ago at Northeastern University here in Boston. And it's a, an interdisciplinary institute in which we are collecting faculty that goes from uh, political science uh, to hard math and computer science, but all with an interest about uh, connectivity patterns. So, you know, in social science and political science, uh, it's crucial what, how we, 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 we influence each other in, in epidemiology, the, our context is that, how to say, the, the highways of, of the virus spreading. Uh, in mathematics and physics, there are other uh, key properties uh, that are driven by, by networks. And so we have this uh, thread and we have a lot of interdisciplinary research that is occurring on, in, in our institute. Uh, and everybody's welcome to, I would say, to visit and, and, and send them an email if you are in Boston and you are interested to, uh, to see uh, network science in action. So now I will share my screen and try to give you an idea of, uh, uh, let me see, uh, yep. Okay, let me, uh, uh, do you see my screen? Yes, I think. So let me, um, the only thing is I have to reposition uh, here one of the sidebar, otherwise uh, uh, I don't, uh, I cover my own screen. Okay, good. So uh, first of all, let me tell you what I will, uh, uh, the various stories I will present here today are uh, the outcome of large scale collaborations, some initiated even uh, 10 or 15 years ago with a large number of, uh, of institutions uh, in the US as well as in Europe. Uh, a lot of, uh, 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 research uh, associate and graduate students and colleagues, uh, faculty colleagues uh, at Northeastern University, but also at the NIH uh, in Spain, uh, MIT, University of Florida, Fred Hutchinson, two foundations in Italy, the Scientific Interchange Foundation and the FBK, uh, and for the specific work in, uh, uh, on, on COVID, also collaboration with Food and University, and Cubic uh, uh, with uh, location, mobile location provider uh, that we are collaborating with. So let me uh, go uh, and, and start uh, from this point that perhaps uh, uh, can be uh, very, uh, uh, how to say, uh, shed some light of, of, of concerning uh, uh, epidemiology. Uh, here is a side-by-side -side comparison of numerical, uh, numerical weather models and numerical epidemic models. So with our numerical weather models, you know, it's the modern weather forecast. And if you think about uh, uh, the, 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 the beginning of the story of, of, of weather forecast is in the 20s with uh, Richardson in the UK, where he did try to integrate manually the equation of the atmosphere to calculate temperature and pressure 24 hours later for a point on the grid of the, the UK map. Uh, 
the, equa the, the results, it took uh, a long time for him to get months of calculation to get the results. At the end, the results were not even correct. And uh, mostly because he was using uh, equations too sophisticated for the data available at that time. And so actually uh, he was not able to, uh, to, 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 to be successful, but it was really, uh, how to say, the, 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 uh, the, the, really the, the, the big idea that, uh, uh, and if you think in the 30s, uh, uh, Reed and Frost in the, uh, in the US uh, define a simple chain binomial model that is a stochastic model uh, to describe epidemics. And they integrated that model on a sandbox computer. They didn't have computers. So they were really taking the red and blue balls from an urns to, how to say, to, for the stochastic part of this modeling. It, it, and in a sense, you know, the two things were pretty much aligned. In the 50, the first numerical weather forecast is implemented at Los Alamos. 24 hour computation on, on a large computers at that time for a 24 hour forecast. You would say it's utterly useless, but actually that was the proof of concept that it was possible to do numerical uh, weather forecast. And in the 1952, the Reed Frost model was numerically implemented for the first time on the same computer. So you see the two stories are side by side so far. But then if you jump just five years, numerical weather prediction models become operational in the US. And then it starts a large stream of funding and building resulted in the building of the huge infrastructure that we have now for weather forecasts. That was obviously for military interest, but civil uh, aviation interest, everything, you know. And now in 2000, you know, we have weather forecasts on our mobile device whenever we want. If you think instead about uh, epidemic models, no, that's not the case. We have to get into the 80s, 2000 to see progress toward uh, large scale models that try to uh, really uh, work at the individual level uh, and, and, and uh, with, with, with uh, how to say, details uh, that can be compared to, to weather forecast. And then, you know, in 2005, the first large scale agent based models, uh, and these were early approaches. Uh, and, you know, the, the first uh, uh, operational uh, computational forecast of the flu season in, is in the US in 2015. So you see that there are basically 15 years of, of uh, uh, difference in the development of the two fields. And the, the things, uh, what, what is the origin of that? Well, it's easy. We sent satellite in orbit, we took data, we build uh, um, meteorological uh, uh, stations all over the world. We develop supercomputing driven by, by, by weather forecasting. That didn't happen for numerical epidemic models. And mostly also because there is another major issue. Epidemic models have society at the center. The way we meet, the way we move, the way we, uh, we create cluster, uh, household, uh, school place, and making measurement of that for that was almost mission impossible for a very long time, or at least on the large scale, on the planetary scale. So what happens is that in the last 20 years, we are shifting gear and we have a huge revolution, that availability in a way that is completely unprecedented. We go from pervasive technologies, and for, yeah, I show on, on, on your left, uh, uh, the, the social pattern uh, infrastructure that allows with simple RFID badge to monitor face-to-face -face interactions on a very highly detailed level with a high quality time resolution. This is an example in schools in France. Uh, and you can really look at the contact patterns, you know, at, 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 in, in real time. Uh, the omics revolution, all our understanding of the working of the cells, uh, our understanding of the working of the organism, networks uh, of infinite kind, including, you know, uh, phylogenetic networks that tells us how viruses and pathogens evolve, uh, mobility networks uh, that goes from, you know, the full international uh, aviation, uh, domestic uh, and international flows to commuting patterns, et cetera. And then population data. Population data, that resolution that we were not even dreaming of a few years ago. You know, all that, you know, can be mapped on top of each other to create basically tomography of the world. And, 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 and those data have really changed the way we can, we can model uh, 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 
society, but as well the spreading of disease in the, in the social aggregate. And then there are also sources that, in a sense, we were not even thinking of a few days ago. So what, what a few years ago, what we call the novel digital data streams. So first of all, all the streams that comes from active data collection, we think about all the participatory platforms like uh, uh, InfluenzaNet in Europe, Flu near you in the US, where uh, volunteers feel constantly questioned with their health status to, uh, to track the flu or other respiratory diseases to what I call passive data collection. The fact that now we write on, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, how we feel, what is our health status, if we have fever, if we, uh, you know, actually much, much more than that. Uh, I will give you example. All data that can be, in a sense, harvested in a passive way because we just expose them to the world and provide uh, understanding of what what what, what happens uh, uh, for for specific diseases if we are able to uh, to pipeline correctly the data. Well, all this data revolution, as uh, you know, a few years ago uh, was dubbed into the big data narrative, uh, uh, and even went into the end of theory, if you remember, uh, uh, editorial on Wired uh, by Chris Anderson, uh, in which he was saying, well, you know, we will have so much data that actually we don't even care about understanding those data. We will just drop those into, into some machine learning, artificial intelligence algorithms, and we will have all the answer we need. We don't need to have the theoretical understanding. And uh, uh, he was closing the, the editorial with a very provocative sentence. It's time that science learned from Google. You know, that uh, was very provocative, but was also somehow the brainchild of, of, uh, of uh, an example, a, a, a stroke of genius in Google that, you know, in a sense, opened also this, this, this area of digital epidemiology to new blood and new ideas. That is the... Uh, just the, the idea of monitoring uh, the flu season, not through the usual collection of, of data from uh, sentinel hospitals and medical doctors that are, as you can imagine, delayed by one or two weeks uh, just for the data collection process, aggregation, statistical treatment, but just through the searches on Google. Uh, on Google. Well, you know, the idea is simple. You have, we have billions of searches, many of them have keywords that are related to the flu. I can extract relevant keywords. I can try, I can train some good uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm with the historical data from the Center for Disease Control. And then I can use data in real time to have the actual, uh, the actual state of the uh, flu season in the US. And that was, was obviously a great, great, fantastic idea. However, there are a lot of problems in, in, in working with data when we, we use just you know, approaches that somehow are and have a black box component. First of all, you know, there is a lack of micro level understanding. So you will have predictions about where the epidemic goes or, or where the, 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 the number of cases of the epidemic and the trajectory in the, uh, in the next couple of weeks, but you don't have a micro level understanding of the process. So for instance, you don't have actual causal inference. You don't have an understanding of what is the vaccination uh, role in the process, uh, what is the, the, the transmissibility of the disease that here. So you want to understand more. You want to have uh, to understand about the, 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 the mechanics of, of the disease spreading, especially as we will see for COVID in the case of new diseases. Well, there are intrinsic biases, data incompleteness, uh, noise. Also the fact that not always more data is not necessarily better modeling. And uh, uh, you can imagine if I use time series of six years ago, I'm talking already of healthcare systems that are very different, uh, of uh, data uh, acquisition that is different. And so in a sense, you know, it's not always good to, 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 to throw everything at the machine in terms of, of the training. And then there are also some more sophisticated uh, uh, ideas. I always suggest that the, the reading of the Orgny Wulpiani uh, Philosophy and Technology Review, uh, where you, you can relate, you know, this inductive approach to dynamical system, the Poincaré recurrence theorem, and understand that if you don't have a theoretical understanding that provides the right 
a low dimensional projection for, for the system, you might have problems in, uh, on the long run with, those, uh, with, with, with just uh, uh, black box uh, uh, tools. That doesn't mean, you know, I'm a big fan of, of my, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and we use, and I will show you also how we use it, but it's just to say that we need to be careful and indeed, you know, some failure of Google Food Trend that actually in the end led to the, to the, uh, to the closure of the project uh, are, you know, somehow some uh, important lessons for the field. And indeed for me, Google Food Trend is a huge success just because of that, for what we have learned through the, how to say, the, 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 the initial success and also the failures of the, of the tool. First of all, the use of surrogate signal in algorithm train on historical data. That, that was an idea that now, you know, can be applied to a multitude of signals. So, you know, we can use open uh, uh, table reservations uh, and, and, and look at uh, last minute cancellation and how they correlate with, uh, with the flu season. We can have wearable devices, we have Wikipedia searches. So we can use a multitude of, of signals that all together are much stronger than just one, absorb uh, issues. And and, and so, you know, this is great. It also allowed us to bring the full power of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the forecasting of, of diseases. And I always suggest to check on the uh, early Center for Disease Control flu challenge that started in 2013. And along the years, you can, you, 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 uh, we have seen, I would say, methodology getting better and better and really data and machine learning are a key component of that success. Well. On the other hand, we need to be careful that uh, for these kind of approaches, there are problems. There are problems uh, uh, for emerging infectious disease like COVID-19. For instance, no training data early on. Uh, the situation is not, in terms of data, is constantly changing, not on the scale of years, but it's changing on the scale of weeks, the reporting, the testing volume capacity, the catchment of cases, uh, the test uh, type used, and so on and so forth. You know, there are a lot of heterogeneous time lags. The time series that we see at the moment, initially every country scrambling to define the data pipeline. So, you know, things are really a moving target. There are also a lot of proxies of those signals that we would like to use that are affected by the heavy non-pharmaceutical interventions that have been taken by, by, by policymakers. Like, you know, if you put a country in a lockdown, well, you know, many of those proxies just, uh, in a sense, are, are, are breaking down because of the change of, of life that we do. And then also social media biases, uh, you know, the way that you search uh, on, on, on search engines or, 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 or other sources is completely different in this. And so what, what we are suggesting? Well, we are suggesting to, to take always the best of, of all worlds, no? And so uh, let's try to have actionable modeling with new data. And when this new data might be big or small, but we have to use all the possible data that we, we, we can. Keeping in mind that we want interpretability, so we want a mechanistic approach to be in the game. So we want to have description of the disease through equations, through a way that uh, parametrization that allow us to understand, you know, if, uh, you know, the, the disease is less or more transmissible or what would be the effect of a vaccine or certain specific uh, interventions. We want to have trajectories that takes into account our knowledge of initial conditions and as well can bound with prediction limits uh, what we do in terms of, uh, of co forecast or projections. And I will talk more about the, 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 the big difference be, be, between the two. So in a sense, uh, going really more from, from, from a time series to something that is uh, more what we do for, 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 for weather forecast. And, and this is a program uh, that you know, uh, implies that we have to go on a modeling spectrum that start from the simple, well, we generally have the ability to explain trends and, uh, and, uh, and also have elegant, uh, in some cases, analytic solution to, to what, uh, what we, uh, we have through instead a series of steps that include more and more complexity of the real world system, including the social structure, the contact networks among the individuals, the contact networks among geographical areas, so how many people travel from one place to another, up 
to the very detailed agent-based models. And all those modeling is computationally and data enabled because we get at certain point in the recreating in the computer realistic uh, micro world representation that in some cases have almost all the complexity of the real world and so you know we want to have first of all good data and we want to have way to validate and assess the validity of, of the results that that we have against uh, real world data well uh, we started this program about uh, this point uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, with collaborators in, uh, that I was mentioning before. And we collected population data, we collected mobility data, uh, like the, the, the full uh, domestic and international uh, aviation association database, the AG scheduler. Uh, thousands of uh, sources for uh, community for for uh, for uh, uh, commuting patterns uh, population data also concerning health care uh, systems uh, age structure and then on top of this world in the computer what we do is to simulate the spreading of the disease in a way that there is no model that fits all disease each disease has its own specific characteristic and peculiarities that make uh, uh, the model uh, realistic to the to the mechanism of the disease spreading so let me be a little bit more uh, give you a little bit more technical view of what is under the hood of this approach uh, and also let me tell that our team work with the global epidemic and really the model there were other efforts uh, across the world that uh, at different scales or at the, at, 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 with different uh, uh, assumptions or resolution are working uh, in order to, uh, to basically create a framework of models that are able to, uh, to uh, forecast and project infectious diseases. Well, in our model, what we do is a tessellation of the world. I'm showing here for you the United States, where we define subpopulation around the main urban, urban areas. And uh, for each of the subpopulation, we collect the information and we need the data that we need. And then we have all this multi-scale framework of origin, destination, and interaction among, among individuals uh, due to travel, commuting, and in, uh, in, the, uh, I would say in the location, that means uh, you know, in the various settings, the school setting, uh, the workplace, uh, the family, uh, and all the possible transmission mechanism of a specific disease. Uh, yeah just to give you a little bit of the flavor of the complexity of that is that you have what we call uh, time scale separation problem you have uh, you look at a city like rome it has origin destination traffic flows with respect of the the world but then uh, then you have you know commuting patterns on the scale of a few hours uh, uh, around uh, around the the, 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 the the main urban uh, area so you have you have the, to integrate equations and systems that uh, really spans uh, uh, landscapes both geographically and in time and if you want is uh, if i can encapsulate in simple words how the, the, the this modeling works is what we call reaction diffusion on a network you have individuals these particles but now they are individuals which are tagged with the information with respect to the disease as well as their age their sex uh, uh, their, their gender they uh, their uh, other attributes that they might might, might have and uh, you know we have algorithms that describe stochastically this is would be for instance here you see i've written a very simple sir model so a susceptible infected uh, recovered model we use models that are much more complex than that but you see it's, the, 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 these models describe stochastically through equation how the disease evolved through the individuals and how individuals can infect other people. And then we have also all the mobility patterns and all the other uh, description of the world that works in a sense by at a granular level where you have single, single individuals. Well, this does, uh, is all live on top of data and data which are data that are uh, uh, collected meticulously. Uh, we use both macro data on sense from census uh, and micro data, so very highly detailed stratified uh, data at the level of single households uh, that tells you, you know, uh, are putting us in the situation of recreating entire households, uh, the workplace, uh, the, uh, the school uh, settings, uh, 
and generally build what we call synthetic population, where you have individuals and their connectivity patterns. And if you really want to work at the smallest scale, you work with this network of interactions. Uh, if you want is that you can stratify those contact patterns across different dimensions like household, school, workplace, and get what we call a mesoscopic description of the system. That means, for instance, you can project all the contact patterns into specific age. So five years old has a certain number of contacts with five years old, 10 years old, 20 years old, and so on and so forth. And so you create huge matrix of contacts in the different settings that you can stratify according to your interest and the disease you are looking at and bring into the infections transmission that now consider all those features and will provide you the model that govern the evolution of Uh, simulations. This is a highly pathogenic disease in London and you see each single uh, uh, each single I'm sorry uh, line here is a single individual traveling on a on a on a plane and seeding the disease in another area of the world and then from that area of the world another infection Hello, uh, can everybody hear? I think we got disconnected. Alex, you're on mute. Alex? Okay, so I'm back. <laughs> okay, good. 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 That's the, the pleasure of uh, uh, the Zoom platform is that uh, uh, when you get too excited, they, they somehow switch you off. Uh, but when you switch off or, or everybody? So we will all everybody switch, uh, switch off. No, I think, I think we're all still there. We're, oh. we're all still here, uh, but we haven't got your screen share anymore. Oh, okay. So did you, where, did you get, uh, I'm trying to share now again. Uh, let me, let me share. Okay, did you, were you able to see this animation? Yes. Okay, good. So, and then I was showing what, what I was talking about what are the problems about these and uh, the major problem is that we have to consider the stochastic uncertainty and so different trajectories starting from the initial conditions of the, the disease. But as well, you know, different possible initial conditions. We never have a certainty on the initial condition of a disease. We know about a certain specific cluster of, of, of cases, etc. Then there are, might be different modeling assumptions, parameter uncertainties, uh, what is the transmissibility of the disease. And so all that is, uh, means that we have to repeat thousands, millions of those simulations and create map uh, that provides probability, like for instance here, I, I'm assuming the importation of a case from, uh, of COVID from some place. Well, this is where we also have the, 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 the issue of, uh, of, uh, of the computing power. So this is uh, means, for instance, if we think about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, computing, uh, we means about millions of runs, millions of instances of 
computers deployed on the cloud uh, and high performance uh, data analysis. So that's, that's where really, uh, for instance, in our case for COVID, we were able just because we had very generous uh, partnership uh, with Google that was providing us Google uh, cloud computing. Well, let me go now into, into something. Everybody talks about forecast uh, with data. Let me say that it's more than forecast. You know, is situational awareness, is intervention planning. There are many, many, many things more than just forecast. Uh, uh, let's look at COVID as the example. Uh, COVID is, you know, started in China. And here you see initially the first case was on December the 8th, uh, but uh, then uh, we, uh, you know, the number of cases started to rise uh, mid-January and, uh, you know, when there were 50 cases, the major question was, okay, what is the reality on the ground? Can we estimate what is the size of the outbreak, the magnitude of the outbreak at that time? This is where also modeling and data enters because at that time, what we did together with other, other teams was to use statistical methodologies that were based not on the number of cases reported in China, but on the number of cases that we were observing in other countries imported from China and doing basically a backtrack calculation, knowing how many people travel from those areas of China in order to estimate the size of the epidemic in those days. And right away, it has emerged a picture in which, in which we didn't have just a few hundred uh, cases or a few tens of cases initially, but actually tens of thousands of cases. And so that the situation in Wuhan was much more, uh, 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 much more uh, serious than, than what was emerging in, initially in the first day of, uh, of the epidemic. Um, the second step was again situational awareness. When you know the 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 the, the map of all uh, of all the possible trajectory uh, uh, of uh, of, uh, uh, of of traveling patterns from that area, you can estimate the relative risk of importation in different places of the world. And indeed, uh, what we were able to to do was to have a list of risk that is reported here. And really, basically, the importation were observed along that, that, that list. So you can really try to get situational awareness on where to expect cases to pop up and where we, we have to set up you know, screening at airports and so on and so forth. And so this is again data and modeling. Well, then at certain point you get more understanding of the disease. You start what we call generative modeling approaches. Well, you have models that really at this point have the disease and its evolution, the incubation time, you have uh, the some insight on the transmissibility, and then you can look at, well, what happens if I have travel restriction? What if, uh, what will be the effect of the uh, fact that uh, basically China closed all the transportation and, 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 uh, and mobility from Wuhan in, uh, in, uh, in mid-January? And so you see those models allows you to tell a little bit what to expect in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the next few days. And for instance, here we show how initially before the travel ban from Wuhan, most of the cases, the big contributor from, for importation in the various country was Wuhan itself, the epicenter of the, of, China, of the epidemic. But then after the closure from Wuhan, cases started to flow from other places in the world, including, you know, Shanghai, and, then, and, and you know, these are cases that uh, were starting to anyway to move across the world. That means that you have to, uh, to be very careful uh, uh, of case importation and very mindful of case importation. And actually the model allows you to look not just at the case importation from China, but that actually was very limited at a certain point because everybody closed most of the traffic from China. But the fact that at that point you have other epidemic, other little outbreaks here and there because of those first initial cases that start to, uh, to create a network of importation of cases as it does happen in the US and Europe in what we call the cryptic phase of the disease. So that phase in which you don't have yet data. It was impossible to have mass testing of cases. Uh, in those cases, the only way was to travel to base the testing based on travel to China, but actually cases at that point were traveling from many other places. And uh, the model allows to find 
specific patterns that then are also, how to say, benefit from other data like phylogenetic data. So that means uh, the sequencing of the genome of the virus that allows to follow the story of, of the virus across the world. And uh, uh, through modeling, you can see, for instance, what are the importation sources for different states in, uh, in, in the US. And you see that China actually was a source of importation for a limited number of cases uh, in initial places like California, uh, mostly, and but actually, you know, cases were coming from other places, especially Europe for New York, Asia for other places of the United States. And then, look, most of the cases for other states in the U.S. were domestic importation. For so the epidemic established itself in a few urban areas and then spreads from there. This is still just to give you an idea. You have epidemiological explanation because you see from modeling and, and data that you know in February when just a handful of cases were, were, were uh, detected in the US actually there were already hundreds of transmission in major urban areas in, in, in the US and, uh, and this allows to understand a lot about the epidemic you can uh, uh, correlate with other data like for instance uh, the places that have observed first the, 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 the onset of the epidemic in the US are all because they are highly connected both internationally and domestically to other places. You can also create counterfactuals. What if we happen, for instance, if we would have been in place uh, and able to have travel restriction one week or two weeks earlier? And unfortunately, you know, that would have not been enough because actually the epidemic in, uh, as we also know from phylogenetic analysis now, started in China in uh, probably in, uh, in mid-November. And so, you know, at the time that we were really not thinking of, of, of COVID. Well, and then from there we go into the scenario analysis. But please believe me, this is something that has been miscommunicated many times. Scenarios are not forecast. Scenarios are based on assumption of what will happen and the possible evolution, especially in terms of policy making. So when you see somebody projecting two or three months in advance, these are scenarios. And you know, a lot can be done to, uh, to change those scenarios. And scenarios should always be offered in portfolio that goes from possibly the worst case to the best case scenario, depending on the policies that are implemented or the known policies that are implemented. For instance, a scenario analysis, you can also do, well, what if we start testing people and what if we start do contact tracing? And this is an exercise that we did in, uh, for the Boston metropolitan area with data coming from, uh, from Cubic. It's about people and, and location of where they were meeting so that we have basically uh, high detailed uh, data of uh, uh, basically people proximity and connectivity so that you can really uh, look at what happens uh, in the unmitigated epidemic and when you start to have uh, lockdowns and closure and so on and so forth. And on top of this, we were able to simulate scenarios in which we were having a certain level of contact tracing and how much each of those scenarios were effective. Now, I don't want to go into the numbers. It's, it's too late. I don't want to uh, speak too much uh, uh, and, and, and go really to a closure. But, you know, there are strategies that allow, if you have enough contact tracing and enough testing, to mitigate the epidemic basically with the minimal uh, uh, disruption to the, to the, to the social uh, uh, fabric, in a sense, in the sense that you don't have to assume much uh, um, very severe social distancing. Uh, but, you know, if you lower the case and then you are able to do the enough, enough contact tracing and Im impose some additional measure like a uh, mask, et cetera, it's possible to, uh, uh, to keep uh, uh, the epidemic at low level of, of activity. Well, how we go from scenarios to forecast? Well, from scenarios to forecast, you need to implement in real time what is on the ground. So you need to have all the prior of initial condition on these models and what they do, but then you need to have the different intervention and school closures, smart working, lockdowns, et cetera, in 
real time, basically. That is another computational problem because it means that like in weather forecast, you have to constantly update your simulations and get real data like, for instance, the one that we get for mobility in the United States from mobile proxies of different kind, like the one offered uh, you know, to the scientific community by Cubic, and there are other actors that are providing, providing similar similar data. And this is a first in a major health emergency to get this data for the scientific community in real time and re they really enable to have detailed models that takes into account individual proximity, individual mobility in a way that you can start to have forecast. But keep in mind forecasts are have a limited time horizon, like, like the weather forecast. You don't do forecast for more than a couple of four weeks and you have a confidence interval, you have a cone of uncertainty, like in every good forecast, and then you, know, then you start to have scenarios. I mean, then you are assuming that what will happen in terms of policy and social, and social behavior. So you know, forecasts of this kind are done now routinely in the United States. There is a, a COVID uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control Initiative, in which each model produces forecast based on the ground truth uh, in previous time. And then you project in the next uh, two to four weeks what will be the trajectory, for instance, the number of fatalities per week. And it's interesting to say also that here is where, again, machine learning is extremely powerful because then you can use a lot of augmentation processes like uh, uh, augmenting the ground truth through uh, now casting of machine learning that happens uh, to be very, very good generally. Mechanistic simulation that instead are a proxy signal or a surrogate signal for, for, for the machine learning. So the machine learning learns how to use that signal better than the signal itself by learning the basically the uncertainty that you have in that signal. And then also using machine learning for the optimization of the parameters and the model themselves. So, you know, there are really a huge amount of synergies that, that are happening between, let's call it the, in, in the, the, in, under the big umbrella, the artificial intelligence data and mechanistic modeling in order to uh, provide more information on, on, on the disease. And this is, for instance, is the operational forecast. I think in the United States is probably the only place where there is really operational forecast on COVID-19 at the moment. That is done through ensemble models. This is really like the spaghetti models that you see for hurricanes, in which you see that different models are complemented together, you know, are, are compounded together to provide you know, a kind of better confidence interval and, and medium trajectory of this uh, epidemiological hurricane by using uh, different models so that, uh, in a sense, uh, you can be more confident about, about what is the, the results. And this is for the next four, four weeks. Well, I just want to close here. There, are, there is much more that is happening and really, you know, one main point that probably has not been communicated properly so far is that models are made to be unquestioned oracles. There is a lot of confusion about uh, 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 forecasts, the projections, uh, uh, awareness tools, uh, and everything is the model predict. It's not like that. You know, they models are not trying to tell us just one precise future. They provide a range of possibilities exactly like the weather forecast, given the facts on the ground, and in some cases, even more than the forecast, because then you're assuming, you know, what policy of, uh, of social distancing there will be. That is something that depends on ourselves. You know, and in a sense, they give this range of possibility given the data that we collect. And not always the data are the best data that we could have. And so also on that side, we can do better and we can improve the, the, the situation. So I think this is really, uh, I want to close here and thank you very much for your attention. Wow. Thanks so much, uh, 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 Alex, for this wonderful uh, presentation and really impressive work uh, that you've been doing. And, um, uh, and I do have a few questions and I will uh, keep it short uh, because I, uh, we're running out of time and, and, and I really appreciate uh, uh, Alessandro for going deep here and showing uh, what are the, uh, the possibilities. But I, I do want to start with your um, comparison with the weather forecast, which I, I like a lot. It's a very compelling uh, uh, comparison because it does give us an insight in, anyway, what we could do and should do uh, based upon what we've done for 
another uh, phenomenon, natural phenomenon such as the weather. And um, but if you there is a, there is a w wonderful book which you probably have read, Alex, which is called The Weather Machine by Andrew mm -hmm. Blum. And uh, and I think uh, one big message uh, that I took away from reading that uh, book was that. Uh, the weather forecast was a result of really international alliances and collaboration, which, by the way, are still very vulnerable. <laughs> and uh, and so, so one question for you then is that, how do we actually get that kind of uh, international collaboration that would provide for the data, but also for the uh, uh, international uh, uh, picture that is needed to deal with pandemics or epidemics uh, like the ones that we are currently confronting. And do you see, are you hopeful in getting any of that established? Yeah, I think, you know, this is uh, one of the major areas in which we have to, in a sense, to improve. I, I, I want to start with, with, with by saying that probably during this COVID crisis, uh, I've seen the, the, the la highest level of international collaboration in my experiences in previous other uh, situations. I, however, especially with health data, as you can imagine, uh, it's it's problematic. You know, sharing health data, uh, social data across boundaries, uh, uh, it's not easy. There are a lot of ethical uh, and ethical and, uh, and and privacy issues. There is also respecting the different nationalities, culture, and so on and so forth. And this is the reason why I hope that there will be a big push. Uh, to create organization, mm -hmm. to create international organization that are brokers for those data. So the World Health Organization is one of those, but there are many others, uh, the United Nations, uh, uh, UNICEF. all those organizations should be very, very active in that, in that area by uh, favoring this, this data sharing collaborative, trying to go over the resistance and in some cases, also the good reasons of many, many countries. I think the academic, for sure the academic uh, uh, community is ready to take on this challenge and to, we, we really have done a lot of work in terms of uh, uh, try to establish as much as we could international collaboration, but we need to have the support of international agencies and national agencies. In the end, if you want, you know, I, 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 we are advocating since many years the creation of uh, outbreak science uh, and national centers across the world that could be uh, uh, connected and, uh, and uh, have collaborations, uh, you know, at the international level, because at that point you would be under the umbrella mm -hmm. of other organizations. So hopefully this will happen after this experience. Great, and, and, and my final question, uh, and I see uh, the next uh, uh, facilitator is already waiting uh, mm -hmm. to, to chime in here. Yeah. And I could, I could spend the whole evening or day uh, uh, asking questions, uh, Alex, because the work you do is so fascinating and really at the forefront of what we should uh, 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 consider moving forward. But um, it reminds me of what we discussed uh, in the uh, prep for this uh, uh, talk, which was, uh, how do we um, not only provide for insight, but then how do we also then make sure that the action uh, 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 follows, uh, which is what you have been emphasizing that it's very important to also contextualize and uh, uh, explain what is the input so that people understand what is the levels of uncertainty, but also what are the, what's the real signal here. But by when we discussed that, you, you emphasized the importance of the media in actually uh, being a actor in being able to also translate your insights to a wider public, including uh, policymakers. And so I would love to get your, uh, uh, your views on that and especially your lessons learned uh, given the current uh, experiences with uh, uh, COVID-19. Well, you know, Stefan, uh, you know, we work with data and, and models. We provide, uh, I, I say, intelligence. But then we can substitute the policymaking process. And this is, was your opening uh, for the talk. You say, well, in the UK, we have these situations. And then, you know, the policymaking is a different thing. It, it, it feeds uh, and, and, uh, on, on this intelligence, but then it, it, it 
takes many other inputs into account and you know we cannot substitute ourselves and it's, there is no way that the science uh, dictates what it is just you know it's evidence and evidence should be however balanced with political reasons with resources uh, uh, with many 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 things uh, so the communication is crucial and first of all develop uh, establish communication channels so we need to have that all the policy makers have uh, are used to talk to the science and the scientists have to be I would say, used to talk to the policy makers it's not an easy part and this is also the data Mm -hmm. uh, people because the data people have to communicate uh, okay there are data and data there are data which are certain data which are not certain data that are generated through machine learning and have other approximations so we need to be able to convey properly the message and then there is another big actor that I see less uh, because there is more and more uh, conferences in which we have scientists uh, organizations uh, and the government policy makers involved I see less on the media side I think uh, the, what happened during COVID, the media was so important in uh, communicating what were the results of science. Also to the policy making, as you say, but in general to the public so that we can accept. And in some cases they did a good job, in other cases they did a very bad job. And, and, and also for them, what is their role in the data management? Now there are some big media actors, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, you know, you know, we, we can say the New York Times from time to time, they say is the New York Times University is producing uh, data analysis at that at professional level, five, many, many partners, you know, they, they are doing incredible things, but they are still media. And we should involve them in the discussions we have about data, about how we enable data sharing, about we enable collaborations, because they are part of this world at this point. And they, you know, inflect, however, much more than us, what is the public opinion, and through them, what is the policy making process. And so I think it's crucial. I see in this COVID the things that there is a huge importance of them in uh, really in the data, in the data. Uh, area management so great with that alex uh, i'm afraid we're gonna have to close this yeah. uh um, um i get all kinds of private messages uh yeah. that uh <laughs> that, that, that we can't answer right? is, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and I, I feel like eventually i'm gonna have to listen and so uh emily is there who is our driver uh and uh master of ceremonies here so which is an indication that uh, uh, the only thing left for us, uh, Alex, is to thank you. Not only thank you for today's presentation, but also thank you for all your efforts in, uh, in really helping us uh, deal with COVID-19 uh, moving forward. And so uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much for you very letting much. me engage with your community. And I'm, I'm really grateful for, for, for this occasion to talk to you. And... Bye. Bye-bye.